Welcome to lecture 2.6, Matrices. In this lecture, we will learn how to encode a linear map with a matrix. Throughout, T will be a linear map from X to U, and we can assume that these are finite dimensional. And I've said this before, but it doesn't hurt to repeat that throughout this class, we can always assume that vector spaces are finite dimensional unless I say otherwise. Now, there are some results that will extend to infinite dimensional spaces, but this is mostly a class on finite dimensional spaces because it's more of an algebra class, not an analysis class, and I don't want to have to say finite dimensional every single time. To encode T as a matrix, what we need to do first is pick what I like to call an input basis for X. So we'll call that BX and an output basis for U. So we'll call these x1 up to xn and u1 up to um. We will also need the dual basis of our output basis bu. So we'll call those covectors l1 up to lm. Once we have chosen our bases for x and u, we'll take t and we'll apply it to every input basis vector xi. So starting with x1, we apply t. That's going to send us over to u, so we can express that image as a linear combination of the output basis vectors. So let's write this down. So tx1, let's call it a11 u1 plus a21 u2. Let's write the ith one as well. So ai1 ui. And then finally we get to the mth one. I don't know if I said that right. A M one U M. That's a tricky one. Mth. Okay. Next, um, T X two. Let's call this one A um, one two U one plus A two two U two plus A I two U I plus A M two U M. And then the Jth one. It's going to be A1JU1 plus A2JU2 plus AIJUI plus all the way up to AMJUM. And I'm doing this because what I want to want to do is come up with a formula for the IJ entry. Okay. We keep going. Um, T applied to Xn is going to be a one n u one plus a two n u two plus a i n u i plus a m n u m. Okay, so what we have done is written each input basis vector multiplied by t or applied t and we get this linear combination and the matrix that we're going to form so we get this two by two or not this n by m grid of numbers that's going to be the matrix so these rows here are going to actually be the columns of the matrix so let's say uh let's write it like this the matrix um, t with respect to B X and B um, U is um, how do I want to write this? How about if I just do this? So I don't need to rewrite these numbers. So this is going to be T X one. This is going to be T X two, and this is going to be all the way up to T x n so let me write a couple of these just so th this is going to be a 1 1 this is going to be a 2 1 this is going to be a 1 2 this is going to be a um, 1 n this is going to be a m n and then this is going to be a m 1 and then someone here is going to be a i j and I, as I promise I'm going to give you a formula for this a i j and think about how we got this so for a formula for this, Aij, what this actually is, it's what, what you get when you take the, the jth 
input basis vector, you apply t to it, and then you pick off the coefficient of the ith output basis vector. So remember how to do that. So um, in general, if you want to pick off the coefficient of the ith basis vector, we take the element, the ith element in the dual basis. So that's going to be Li, which is in the dual basis of Bu. So Aij is quite literally what we get by applying Li to Txj. So I like to think of this in order that we do it. We start with, the, with xj, we apply t, and we pick off the ith coordinate. Now, one more thing about this is it's so easy to confu get confused, you know, to mix up aij and ji to you know, forget if 2, 1 goes here or, if, or if it goes, goes here, goes here. I mean, I know it's extra weird because we wrote rows here and columns here, but the, the reason why is because you know, we write in English left to right in rows, not by columns. So that's, that's really why it's, it just happens to be an artifact that, the, um, that these things don't match up. Um, but remember that we said that the column space is the image of the linear map, and that's exactly what these columns are. These are the, the, out, or the or these are the images of the input basis vectors with respect to the output basis. Finally, this matrix, um, it's easy, easy to forget if it's n by m or m by n. Remember that, I think I said this before, but if not, um, how I think about this is I go, I draw an L, I go this way, and I go this way. And so how long was it? So going down, we had, what is that, um, m row? Yeah, so we have m, m of these rows, and we have n columns. So this is, say it with me, m by n. So sometimes we put an n, or sorry, m by m, m by n right there. And of course, that means that the ij entry is what you get by going down i and over j. Let's summarize what we just did, because it's important. If t is a linear map from x to u, then the matrix, let's call it A of t, with respect to the bases bx and bu, is just the image of the columns of the input bases. Now, these are the column vectors. Now, there's, I don't know if this is the most standard way to write this, but it's, and it's a little clunky, but it gets the point across that this is the matrix t with respect to this input basis and that output basis. As we said before, the range of t is the span of the column vectors also known as the column space. You can see it literally right here. Finally, a formula for Aij is just Li of t xj. So here's that grid that we wrote out in the previous slide. And here's that matrix. Notice how these entries, these columns, are just the coefficients in the corresponding rows right here. Let's do an example. So let's let t be the linear map from R2 to R2 that simply projects any vector onto the line y equals x. So let me draw a picture of this. It's a simple enough concept. y equals x, of course, is this line at a 45 degree angle. And so what this does is if we have a vector v, then tv just projects it um, to become this vector that's on that, that line. So this is TV. If W is, if this is W, then TW is, is this vector right here. So we need to pick an input and output basis. And so let's pick our standard basis. So let's let BX be equal to E1 and E2. And we'll call that BU as well. We'll generally want to pick our input and output basis to be the same. Um, you, know, you don't necessarily have to pick the standard unit basis vectors. You, you may know that sometimes an eigenvector basis, or whatever that is, is more convenient. But we don't usually want these things to be different. Though that said, I will in the next slide show you an example of a cute trick we can do if we pick them to be different. But uh, practically, we generally want these to be the same. OK, so let's, let's pick. So here's, here's E1, and here's say, E2. So this is going to be E2. And if we project these onto this line, what we get 
is TE1 plus TE2. Just a basic trigonometry, tell, trigonometry tells you that this is one half of the length of, so this is one half of this plus one half of this. So this is, in other words, so sorry, this is, this is equal, not plus. These are equal, and this is one half e1 plus one half e2. So let's take our input basis, take t e1 and e2, and let's apply t to it. If we do that, we get you know something times e1 plus something times e2. And just from this picture, you can see that the, that those coefficients are going to be one half. So we get one half, one half one half, one half. So here, our matrix um, T with respect to, here's the, the output, let's call it BU, and here's BX is just one half, one half, one half, one half. Okay, so that is um, one way to do this. Let me instead pick a different basis. And let me think if I want to draw a whole new thing or if I want to just pick, um, you know, I think I can squeeze it in here. So I'm going to pick, a, so how about if I pick, what color do I want to use? I was going to use green, but I don't, anyone who's red-green color by might have trouble. So so I'm, I'm going to actually pick, um, it doesn't really matter what, um, how about if I do this? Let's Let's pick a vector here. Um, V1, I was going to pick it smaller, but let's, as long as V1 lies on this line, we're good. doesn't matter if it's, you know, how long it is. So I'm, I'm going to pick V1 to lie on this line of projection. And then I'm going to pick V2 to be really any vector that is orthogonal to this line. So it doesn't really matter if it's up here or down here. Um, basically, we're picking one that's going to get sent to zero via T. So let's call this, this V2. So now let's uh, let's pick b uh, x prime to be um, v one and v two, and I don't think I need to write out what this is in the old base. You know, we, you could write this in terms of e one and e two. I don't think it's really that important. I think it should be clear from the picture. This is also going to be our output basis. So I'm putting the prime up here because it's not the basis of the dual space. It's the base, It's a different basis of u. Okay, so we're going to pick this. And now, now look what happens. So let's take v1 and let's take v2. And, let's, and if we apply t to it, then we're going to get some linear combination of v1 and v2. Something like, like this. And of course, we've picked this. So v1, we apply t to it, it gets fixed because we're projecting it onto uh, itself. So this is 1, 0, and then uh, this, this next entry, I switched my colors, oh well, is 0, 0, because v2 gets squashed to 0. So here, the matrix um, for this one is just 1, 0, 0, 0. So these are two different matrices that represent entirely the, you know, the identical map, but with respect to a different basis. Now be careful. If we have two matrices and we don't specify the basis, and I think we're probably assuming that we're using the standard basis, and in that case, these represent different linear maps. So I'm not saying that these two matrices always represent the same map, but we can pick our bases so that they do represent the same map, just with a different choice of bases. Um, okay, so let's see if there's anything else I want to say about this. You may recognize that this, both of these, v1 and v2, are eigenvectors, if you know what that is. If not, that is fine. We will study that fairly soon. So there's typically two nice choices of bases for, you know, a standard Euclidean space. You either have your standard basis or you have a basis of eigenvectors or as we will see later, later, generalized eigenvectors. Now, there, there's other ones as well. Those, those are not just the two ones, but those are probably the most common ones. This one, the standard basis, because it's easy to visualize, and eigenvectors, because I think computationally um, comes up a lot in applied math. Um, it's probably 
more useful for a lot of applications. But there, there are others as well, and we, we will see some others in this class. I'm going to do one more example, but before that, I want to show you a neat little fact about our choice of matrices, and namely, if T is an invertible matrix from or invertible linear map from X to U, then we can always choose an input and output basis, so the matrix is the identity. Now you can think about this visually or algebraically. I'll do both. Um, well, if this is invertible, then these have uh, the same dimension. So like let's let's let uh. Well, in this case, let's let's pick any basis for x, x1 up to xn be any any basis for for x, and if we take let's do what we did before x1 up two up to xn, and let's apply t to each one of these, and think about how we're going to construct such a thing. So t of each of these is a linear combination of of the bases. Or of, of some right now unknown basis basis of u. So we're gonna have so the question is how how to pick u1 up to u n so that our matrix A, let's just call it A again, is the identity. So ones here and zeros everywhere else. So in other words, what we need is is so I'm, I'm going to write blank u1 plus blank u2 plus all the way up to blank un, and then blank, I'm going to keep doing that. And then finally, txn is some linear combination of these ui's as well. So what we need is ones along here, and we need zeros everywhere else. And if you look at that, Look at what u1 is. u1 is literally equal to tx1. u2 is equal to tx2, etc. So we can uh, let ui be equal to txi. Now the picture of that is suppose that we have. I'll draw a three-dimensional space here. Suppose we have our standard basis vectors. We we can we can pick our standard basis. So why not e1, e2, e3. And we apply t. Now that's that's going to send these basis vectors to I don't know something else. Maybe this is t e one. Maybe this is t t e two, and maybe t e three is down here. And they are a basis because t is invertible. And so we are just going to declare this to be v one. We're going to declare sorry u one because we're picking our uis in in here. And I'm going to call this one u two, and I'm going to call this one u three. And that is that. With respect to this basis, this is anything we want. These are the images. The, um, the matrix of this linear map is the identity. Now, I can actually generalize this, not just for invertible linear maps, but for any linear map from X to U, not necessarily same dimensional spaces. Again, we are assuming finite dimensional spaces. We can choose an input and output basis. So the matrix in block form is, so when I say block form, this is, um, all of these are zeros. So we, we have an R by R block that looks like the identity matrix, and then any remaining entries are zero. So what this, how you should think about this is it's, so if this is a rank R linear map, then you have, then this upper R by R block contains zeros or ones on the diagonal zeros elsewhere and then anything else if there are any other entries everything else in this matrix is zero so we can often write this in block form that's something that i i put, thought about putting this in 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 a back of a lecture i think maybe even the uh the algebra lecture but um generally if we have like a large matrix sometimes it is helpful to break it up into smaller blocks like if we have maybe if A, B, C, D, so maybe this is like a 10 by 10 matrix and these are like two by two and eight by eight and two by eight and eight by two. As long as we are consistent with the sizes of the blocks, E, F, G, H, you know, we, we can't have this be two by two and this be four by four, but if we're consistent, we can multiply them as if these were just regular numbers and everything works out just fine. So it's a convenient thing sometimes. Okay, so anyways, this is a lot more complicated, but because 
we got to be really careful. So what we can't do here is just pick any basis for x and have it work out. And you can sort of see that because if, if you try to start with, with r3, say, and let's say that our, our um, map takes r3 and it projects it. Um, I mean, you know what? I'll do an easier one. Let's take the, uh, let's take the map uh, that we did before. We project onto a line, a 45 degree angle. And this one, you know, we got a matrix A equals 1, 0, 0, 0. But um, we were quite constrained of how we picked our bases. We had to pick, um, um, let's call it V1 here. And we had to pick V2 to be orthogonal to it. So if we had started with our unit basis vectors, we would have been out of luck. We would not have been able to do this. So, so how are we going to do this? So think about what we need. So we sort of have to, uh, so I'll, I'll give you an outline of how this is going to work. So um, we have x, r plus 1. So, we, so we're going to somehow have to pick a basis for, for x. So I'm going to write them like this. And let's assume that this um, linear map has rank r. So that means that the, um, the range has dimension r. Um, okay, so uh, what do I want to? Say? I'll get there in a, in a bit, but let's think. I'm thinking about where we need, should go. So let's let's apply t to each of these. And again, we I haven't told you how to pick these things. We don't know yet, but we're we're just trying to figure out what we have to do. So, so something times u one plus something times u two plus something times u r plus, and then we have to keep going maybe plus something times u m. Um, and, and, and let's, and let's say that, that the rank of T equals R. So what we need is again, T X two is going to be some linear combination of these, um, UIs, something times U M all the way up to T X R is something times U one plus something times U two plus something times U R. And then finally, this is going to be the block that is going to have to be the identity, where R is the rank. And then let me keep going. And then finally, we have blank U1 all the way down to blank U. And I'll just keep filling this out. And everything outside of this blue box is going to have all these coefficients are going to have to be zero. U R plus one plus U M. Okay, now let's see what we need. We need ones to be on this diagonal, and we need zeros to be literally everywhere else, inside and outside of this box. Okay, so how do we get this? Well, if we know what X one is, then we know what U one is. But we're sort of in this chicken and the egg problem because to figure out u1, we need x1. And if we have u1, we can take any preimage to get x1. So how do we do this? Okay, so let's let's let uh what we're gonna basically do is take the range, which is r dimensional, and take a basis for the range, any basis. And we'll call that u1 up to ur, and we claim that that works. So let's write that down. So let's let uh u1 up to ur be a basis for the range of t. Now, what I want to do here is I, I want to um, basically take these other uis, um, ur plus one up to um. um oh, sorry, I actually I realized I I think I wrote this I wrote this wrong. This should be ur, and this should be ur. Yeah, these are ur. Ur plus one would be like uh, blank U R plus one. Sorry about that. Um, so we need these other UIs or UIs to basically be in um, the consent. Um, what are those? The, basically, in the orthogonal complement of this. So if this is um, in this case, the range is this line, and V two worked because it was in the, in the orthogonal complement. Now I haven't talked about orthogonal complements. I mean, I've mentioned the word, but I haven't formally defined it. So I feel like I'm trying to dance with my hands tied behind my back. There's things that I can't really do. So what also won't work is we can't just 
arbitrarily extend this this to a, any arbitrary basis because we might get unlucky if we had taken v1 and we extended this to a basis you know, v2 might have been along the x-axis that would not have worked it would project down to something non-zero so what we basically have to do is we have to is is these vectors all have to pro be projected down onto the range have to be zero we also have not defined projection so although projection is a pretty easy concept um, so let's see how do i want to do this um, um, the linear i'll do it up here the linear map let's call it p um, RT, so this is the projection onto the range of U to itself, has clearly has rank R. So we are taking arbitrary vectors and we are every vector ends up on the range and, and it's the identity on these vectors. Now, now what do I mean by the the linear the the projection map? So so what I so what I mean by that is let's let's take a basis for U. Let's take this basis for U for, for these UIs, and let's extend it to any basis of U. So, so let's, um, I'm really running out of room. So, so let's take an arbitrary element, C1, U1 plus dot, 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 C, R, U, R. And then we're extending our basis plus, let's call, say, C, R plus one, V, R plus one, plus C, any way you want to, C, um, M, V M. So these, I picked these bases. I just extended this arbitrarily. I don't have any choice of that. And the projection map, I'm just going to call it instead of P R. I'm just going to call it P. P is going to take this thing and it's just going to kill off everything that is not in the range. So it just sends these guys. So it, it sends this linear combination to this linear combination right here. Okay. So this is a matrix that has rank R. So the null space is going to have rank M minus R. So the, so the null space of P has, has, has dimension um, M minus R. So now let's let these, let's pick a basis for the null space. So I, I, I'm going to let, uh, let U R plus one all the way up to U M be a basis for the for the, let me just say, the null space of the projection onto the range of T. And I've defined up here what this is. So now we have our, our output basis. Now we've got to pick our input basis. So once we have these UIs, TIs, we'll just take any pre-image. So this is in the range, so it has a pre-image. And then, so let me say that. So let, um, T I be any pre image of U I. So in other words, T X I equals U I. And then I claim, um, um, well, let's see what I want to say. Um, no, actually let's, let's do this. Um, before I do that, then let's extend this to a basis. Um, so we, so we have u1 up to, or sorry, x1 up to xr that we got from our pre-images, but then we want to extend this to xr plus one up to xn. Um, let's see, how, how do we want to extend this? Do we, actually, you know what? We can't just extend this arbitrarily. We need these things to be in the null space. T of, uh, T of xi down here has to get mapped to zero. Of to ex extend there's to a basis where these guys are is a basis of the null space of T. So I'm not going to prove every detail that this works. These are things you have to check. You have to che check that these guys are linearly independent. That's not true. You, you, you have to show that the, that these guys form a basis of the range. You got that they're independent. They clearly span. You got to show that these are independent. You got to show that these are independent, and then you got to show that this. This here is a basis for the entire space X. So these are things you got to show, but it does work out, and it shows you how this generalizes. This simple thing we saw with the uh, um, with with a map that's invertible, 
But we got to be a little careful. For, for this one, we could pick our input basis however we wanted to. Here we can't. We got to be careful. We got to start with the basis for the range. We got to be careful with how we extend it. We pull this back to a basis uh, to, to these elements in X, which we claim, which we claim are linearly independent. And then we take a basis for the null space of T and we put those together and voila, we have it. This matrix right here. Okay, so now we will do, I think one more example, but I see I have two more slides. Oh, that's right, we do have one more example and then we will talk about the, trans, the matrix of the transpose. Okay, so let's let X be this space of polynomials of degree less than or equal to two over R. So it's three dimensional and a basis is one X and X squared. Let U be the space of degree zero and one polynomials over R that has a basis one and X. And let's consider the linear map that's just the simple differential operator, D, DX. So T sends a polynomial like this to its derivative. Let's write out the matrix of this with respect to this basis. So our matrix, I'll just call it A. Um, well, what do we do? We, we take our input basis, one X, X squared. We apply T to it and our output basis, each of these is a linear combination of one plus X. And here the order matters. So I'm starting with um, um, an increasing degree order. It's, you know, we, we, we could switch the orders between these, but it's, it, we really should be consistent. We're either increasing or decreasing. So I'm doing it this way. Okay, so the derivative of one is zero. The derivative of x is one. So that's one times one plus zero times x. The derivative of x squared is, um, what is this? This is two x. So that's gonna be two x uh, and then plus zero times one. So our matrix, again, these are the columns right here. So our, our matrix is just zero, zero, one, zero, and zero, two. So what this matrix is doing is it's making, matrices are basically a tool for us and only for us. It's a way for us to easily compute things, to algorithmically do things like row reduction, uh, um, Gaussian elimination, things like that. Um, and it's just easier to handle these grids of numbers than it is maybe to handle polynomials like this. So by writing it like this, we're just saying that uh, it's basically an isomorphism. So instead of dealing with this space, we're dealing with R3, and this space we're dealing with R2. Okay, so let's uh, do one more sub-example of this where let's do a different basis. So let's, let's now suppose that we have B prime x, which is, I don't know, uh, well, let's do one x and x squared, but just, just to, make, to change things up, I said we wouldn't pick different bases for uh, different input and output bases, but, well, these are different spaces, but just to make things interesting, let's see what happens if we do. So instead of one and x, let's do one uh, plus x, and let's do um, one minus x. No, you know what, I'm, I'm gonna do x plus one and x minus one. I don't know, for some reason that's psychologically a little bit easier. So let's let's do T, so let's take our input basis, T1, uh, X and X squared, and let's write these as something times X plus one plus something times X minus one. I don't really know how hard or easy this is gonna be. X plus one plus something times X minus one something times x plus one plus something times x minus one. Okay, so one, the derivative of one is zero. So we put a zero in both of these. The derivative of x is one. So how do we get one from these two things? We, we uh, subtract them and we get two. So let's subtract them and divide by two. So we get one half and one half. And now the derivative of two x squared is 2x. And how do we get 2x from here? We, we just add them. So we get one of these and one of these. So now the matrix with respect to this basis, again, we take the, the rows here are the columns. So 0, 0, 1 half, 1 half, and 1, and what? Is that really? Hold on. If we take 1, um, yeah, one half and one half, these are gonna add up. 
um, the x, and then here we just take one, one, and we get two. Okay, so there it is. So, um, so here are two different matrices that represent this linear transformation with respect to a different bases. In the next lecture, we will try to understand how these matrices are different. So what can we say about all matrices that represent the linear, or if we have two different bases, what can we say, how, how are their matrices similar or different? No pun intended with that similar thing. If they're square, they will be similar, but it's less clear what happens if they are rectangular like this. Okay, the last thing we're gonna do is take a linear map from X to U and look at what the matrix of the transpose of the linear map is. Now, you know the answer. It's the transpose of the matrix. But let's try to understand why that is. Now, I've given you reasons about row vectors and column vectors and how rows are linear scalar functions and think of column vectors as vectors. And hopefully that's been fairly convincing why it actually is the case. But let's give an actual rigorous, indisputable proof involving the definition of what the entries AIJ are. Okay, so T, linear from X to U. As before, we pick bases, an input basis and an output basis. So we have a matrix. And once again, I will let L1 up to LM be the dual basis of BU, our output basis. If A is the matrix of T with respect to these bases, in plain English, AIJ, that is the IJ entry, is the result of first starting with the Jth basis vector in X, so that is XJ, applying the map T, so we get TXJ, and then applying the ith dual basis vector. That just means we are picking off the ith coordinate of this. So we get blank times U1 plus now you get blank times ui plus blank times um, and the, the idea here is that this aij is precisely the coefficient of ui. So if we take the ith uh, dual basis vector, li, and apply that to x tj, that just picks off this coefficient and we get aij. So let's apply these three steps in order to the transpose map to find the matrix form. In other words, let's come up with a formula for the ijth entry of the transpose. And you probably know what it's going to be. It's going to be the a, a it's going to be a ji, the jith entry of this. Because by transpose, we just, you know, you know, an undergraduate class, you exchange rows and columns. Well, let's verify. So we will start with the jth basis vector in. So let's write this down. So we'll start, start with jth basis vector in the domain. So that, that's in U prime. So that we are starting with Lj. We are applying, next we are applying the linear map, in this case, the transpose. So apply the linear map T prime. So we get T prime Lj. And finally, we apply the ith dual basis vector in the codomain, the dual space of the codomain. So, or target space, I should say, because I don't want to use overuse the term co. So that's that's the dual of x prime. So apply the ith uh, uh, basis vector in x double prime. And what is that? That is literally the evaluation map of plugging in xi. So remember, if we associate x double prime with, with x as we identify as we always do, then that is just the ith vector xi. In other words, we are plugging this in to here. So the result of this is that aij prime is we are plugging in xi into t prime lj. So we are plugging xi into here. If you want to be really precise, you can say, oh, well, this is the 
evaluation map of xi at txlj, you know, so that this thing is in x double prime and this thing is in u prime, but when we identify this with x, then, then we just write this normally where this, this thing here is in u prime and this thing here is in x. And of course, when you look at this, the thing that, you know, it's, you have this desi itching desire to move that t over, this is lj comma txi, that's the property of transposes, we can move them back and you lose or gain that little uh, prime. And this is, you remember, see, recognize that? That is the definition of aji. So this is a very clean reason why, I'm not gonna write it down, but I will say it, the matrix of the transpose map, that's abstract transpose between the dual spaces going backwards, is the transpose of the matrix. That is, if you take the matrix and you swap rows and columns, in other words, you, you reflect it across the main diagonal, AIJ and AJI, you know, reverse places, that's exactly what happens. Okay, so uh, we got, I think, one more lecture in this series, and it's all about how does the matrix change when we change basis. So you've likely heard about things like change of basis matrix, change of basis matrices. You maybe heard that term. I'm sure you've heard seen similar matrices. We actually mentioned that in an earlier lecture. Things like A P P inverse, and this is the spoiler that um, if you conjugate matrices then you are describing the same linear map and this matrix P is what we call a change of basis matrix. It's the, actually the matrix that sends one basis to another. So stick around and we'll see that in the next lecture.